Yes. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, again, uh, it's such uh, a nostalgic feeling for all of us uh, to be back uh, to the it's which where it all started uh, ten years ago, and very happy. Yeah, I, uh, I I hope I it's, a lot of people would not know me. Yes. So, so, yeah. Okay. So my name is Dwarika Unyal. Uh, I was an odd man out there ten years ago. I'm an odd man out here <laughs> after ten years as well. Uh, I was the only faculty member in the business school which didn't exist. <laughs> uh, all of you had a law school, you had students, and you were part of the faculty, and I was like, who is this guy, right? Uh, and uh, it was, but I, I, the kind of uh, love and respect and affection I received from all of you, uh, even that time was amazing. And I've never felt that uh, I'm an outsider in that sense because the law school was the first one and I was not a lawyer or otherwise. Though it was interesting because uh, many of you, it was your first job. Or many of you, you were getting into the academics for the first time. Raj, DK, Aman were there in that. And before I came to Jindal, I already had 10 years of academic and teaching experience. So in a sense, I was like kind of a... Uh, old man which didn't look uh, old, I don't look either now, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, I'm very uh, proud and privileged to, to anchor this session. Uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Priya to uh, uh, speak about her reflections from the time of Jim Khanna to <laughs> our Sushant City tales to multiple other uh, experiences she, you had. Uh, and then your own personal journey after leaving Jindal, what you've been doing. And that would be very interesting, you know, it's all started here, but after we are all coming, uh, because some of us are coming back uh, to, to, to this campus after 10 years, so it would be nice to also know about your personal journey, professional journey, uh, associations with Jindal all these years, and you know, all those things, all yours, Priya, thanks. Oh, thank you so much. So we have an hour 15 for this, I guess. <laughs> No, so actually, um, first I want to do all the normal thank yous, but actually I just want to get right into it and say that one thing that I've really been reminded of today and that I'm constantly reminded of when things are difficult is how powerful it is to just have people in a room. I mean, it's an incredibly powerful thing. And I didn't know that this conference room had been renamed Big Bang, but I think it's very, it's very apropos that it has been. And I'm also really happy that there's some recognition we all were in this, literally, this one room, you know, when the... the same yeah. yeah, same table, I noticed. Yeah, I, I did recognize it when I came in. Um, and this was all construction site before the school started, you know, and we came for that first faculty meeting. And then when school started, we were all around this table. Like, we each had an office. We had a seat and we had an office, and we had students, we had office hours, we had students come in, and in this room, it was the only thing that was built. Like, lit like this was my office. And then I had, I had office hours here, with Alokic actually, I remember it was my first office hour student. I had office hours here. It's just, it's, it's crazy to think that, you know, we didn't know what was coming, actually. Like, we were just kind of existing very much in the present moment, and I don't think that I fully grasped how powerful that was, that all we were were people in a room. Like, we didn't really, you know, the library was still being built. Everything was still being built infrastructure-wise. So we, all we had was what we could say to each other. And then we had four classrooms, right? And when I walked into that room, I had never taught before really, except for maybe one-off sessions a little bit you do as a mentor here and there, but not formally. And you walk into that room and the, and the first thing that struck me is that it's just me talking to them. Like I had a PowerPoint thing and I had notes and I had the book and I had everything, but it just occurred to me that the next session that whatever was gonna happen was just gonna be me talking to them, and then hopefully they would talk back, which in the beginning was a little bit difficult. And so it was a lot of me talking to them. And I think that sometimes, you know, when things are really difficult or I don't know what will happen in the future, or I'm trying for this and that, I remember that, and I remember this room really in particular, that we just sat here and we were just, I don't know, 10, 15 people, and then a lot of things happened from there. 
And also I remind myself that we were very, very different people and we still are. I mean, the gaps in this room are enormous in terms of sensibility, in terms of politics, in terms of you know, research orientation, discipline, age, gender, sexual orientation. There, there's no gap that, that didn't exist in this room then too. And, and, and I think that, um, that that's also a really powerful thing is that we were such a well-knit faculty that even if we had all of our disagreements, we were still in this giant project together. And I can't tell you how much I miss that. That like this underlying understanding that even though we may fundamentally disagree with each other with very many things in life, we are gonna make this university happen. And I don't, I don't know that you have that again, really. You know, I mean, I don't know that you go somewhere else and you have that because people all come there, you know, fully formed and with their own agendas and their own expectations and their own stuff outside that takes them away from the university. And here I feel like because of that, it means that anytime I meet somebody who's faculty at Jindal, and I meet a lot of them at different conferences and I didn't know them because we didn't overlap, there's a camaraderie that's even more than if we were alumni of the same per, uh, school as a student. There's, there's uh, oh, we're in the same boat. Like, where's that boat is still there and we're still, part of us will always still be in that boat together. And, and I really, really miss that. Like, I think, I, I miss it because I feel like I don't come here often enough but I also miss it because I, I worry that I'll never have it again in the pres whatever present institution that I'm in. So with that said, I thought I would just reflect very briefly on the, te uh, the teaching and research and friendship. And one of the most powerful lessons that I had at Jindal was that, I guess as, as Jay put it earlier in relation to Raj, was that, well, anything can happen. And I think that I've approached my teaching that way in large part because everything did happen those first couple of years. So not only did we teach, which was already an incredible privilege, but we taught everything. So when I applied for jobs later, you know, two or three years in, the list of courses that I, one had already taught was unthinkable. <laughs> I taught macroeconomics <laughs> and English. <laughs> and the clinic, not to mention that, oh, torts was my main course. And you know, and I had the confidence to do that then, right? So then later, anything that comes my way teaching-wise, I'm like, Psh, <laughs> we can do that. We can teach anything. And also, because we had the smaller classrooms and we were really trying to make it innovative, the, the idea that we would show movies or that we would do moots or that we would have class exercises wasn't just something that had to be justified, it was something that one did. And that's been also really powerful because I think that after this, there's just convention out there. Like after this, my career, I think for me personally, has been completely wonderful. But in terms of institutions, and I've also visited at institutions, at two institutions also, it's, you know, you're fighting against convention because you're fighting against things that have been done for a really long time. And to be kind of, inculcated at such an early stage in one's academic career in the idea that you can do different types of things in the classroom, that you should do different types of things in the classroom, that it's very powerful to, has informed not only what I actually do in the classroom, but also a sensibility towards teaching that I don't think I would have had had I you know, gone on the US market that entered into some US law school as some super junior person who was constantly being told like what to do or how to do or even which case book to use. Then in terms of research, um, yeah, I think I could only be grateful for the critical journey that this place put me on. I learned so much from being in India and from my peer faculty that, that continues to inform everything I write. And it, and it comes up a lot when people ask me, you know, oh, you've written about this in India or that, and it's all, it's really all because I was here, and it's all because I learned from people, and it's all because we were in each other's offices all the time, and so we saw what each other was reading, and even, we had very different disciplinary areas, but I think in that sense, many of us had a really similar critical sensibility when it came to approaching research. And I learned an incredible amount of, um, like the methodological questions that people ask from my peers that continue to be, oftentimes more critical than the people I find myself in, in terms of research circles internationally. 
And then finally, in terms of friendship and relationships, um, I said it before, probably 10 years ago, but my, um, my father's family is from Sonipat, actually. And they moved from Sonipat to Delhi when he was a teenager. All of them moved. Everybody moved. And so they never went back. So when I was growing up, we never went to Sonipat. But I knew that as this, oh, Sonipat, it's near Panipat. That's literally the only, the only thing I could say about Sonipat was that, oh, it's near Panipat, which isn't even necessarily true. You know. <laughs> so then this happens. And... You know, I, I go from Delhi to Sonipat, literally. I mean, we travel from Delhi to Sonipat. And I can't underline enough how no one in my family can believe that this has happened. And then when faculty housing happens, and so I live here, it's even more unbelievable <laughs> that, you know, they moved, they moved in something like 1954, it must have been, oh, wow. right? 1954, the whole family moves to Delhi, never to go back. They don't visit, like everybody's moved to Delhi. And the thought that, you know, one of the children of the people who went to America would come back and then live not in Delhi, but in Sonipat is just, it really all, it really does teach you that, you know, you don't really know what's going to happen. Like, you don't really know, you know, where your life is going to take you. And so when Raj opened today and talked about the incredible transformation of Sonipat, I'm a bit in awe, and I also can't wait to just tell my parents that that's how the day opened, because it means so much to my dad in particular, that, and also in kind of a, in a, it means so much, but it's also a little bit unfathomable that this has happened, right? And that also Sonipat has changed. And so in the, in the beginning when I was here, I kept wondering if there was something that I was meant to do in Sonipat. Like, okay, now I've come back inexplicably, and I'm here, and so is there something, like am I meant to do something in Sonipat? But I think over time I realized that actually it's not that, it's not so explicit. It's more just about the idea of having a relationship with a place that one doesn't fully try to define or fully try to grasp or try to make it a you did this, I do this in return, just that you have a relationship. And I think that that is also true for many of the relationships that we made here. I mean, a lot of us we disagreed very vehemently very often, and yet we still find ourselves together, and we still find ourselves overjoyed if we see each other. And that's a really powerful lesson that one doesn't often get um, kind of in the, in the professional and personal realm of life. And so I thought I could close by reading what I have to say in all seriousness is one of my favorite emails. I think I sent this out maybe the five-year anniversary too, but okay. Dear colleagues and staff of JGU, greetings from room 007 in northeast block of student housing. It is a great feeling to stay in one of the rooms of the student housing. It is actually looking very good. There is so much of passion, commitment, generosity, and sacrifice of many people over the last 18 months to establish this university. I will be staying here tonight remembering this and at the same time looking forward to the exciting days and weeks ahead. A number of students have started to come and chat with me tonight about various things, including infrastructure, as well as academic and cultural life on campus. I feel that we have got a good group of students here with us, and we can make things happen due to the sheer energy and enthusiasm of these young people. Next door to me, our students are preparing for the cultural program on 4th October. There is a rock band out here, and they are a bunch of highly talented people. I would like to thank all of you for your hard work and personal sacrifice that you have undertaken. I appreciate your encouragement and support. With warm regards and good night. Oops. Thank you, Priya. I think that, that we all have read that mail and, and it really uh, did give us a lot of um, you know, nostalgic feeling, and as uh, uh, Professor Murthy was saying, Amanji was saying, all of us had warden duties, and uh, those earlier days were really, really, really interesting. And uh, in your case, it's completely uh, incredible that uh, from 1954 to 2009, you know, it's it's completely uh, in a typical Bollywood style, filmy, you know. That was scary. <laughs> wow, amazing. Uh, Rehan, uh, your reflections, please. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, I'm, I'm truly delighted to be here and want to thank Raj and Oishi and Deepika for organizing this and for inviting me. Um, my first thought when I realized that it was 10 years, which it was, I didn't fully appreciate, was just a kind of very shallow thought about how much Jindal's reputation has grown internationally. So I remember when I first joined here, I had a whole routine of how I would explain this place to people. So where do you teach? Teach at a private law school near Delhi. Oh, is it in Delhi? No, it's near Delhi. Where in Delhi? Where near Delhi? Oh, in Haryana. Oh, it's in Gurgaon. No, it's, no, it's, no, it's not in Gurgaon. Then where is it? It's in Sonipat. Where is Sonipat? <laughs> and then so, so all of this went. Now, and I'm not kidding, I'll go and I won't even say Delhi. I'll say I used to teach at a private law school in India. And most people will say, oh, you mean Jindal. Right? And I think that's really incredible. Um, and it, it's a noticeable change. And they say it in a very positive way. Like, oh, good for you. You taught it, Jindal. Um, a quick confession. I mean, you all know this, but I should say it. Um, I wasn't here at the beginning. Um, <laughs> I was in law school in 2009, um, and I want to just say quickly sort of the very fortuitous path that led me here. Um, I then want to sort of recollect a couple of early memories, and then, um, as Priya did as well, just quickly talk about um, research, teaching, and friendship. So in my final year of law school, so that was 2000, beginning of 2010, I took a seminar class on uh, John Rawls and the Constitution of the US. Okay, and I was like, okay, this is fun, I'm gonna graduate, like, you know, might as well have, some, like, just take a, 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 a relatively sort of, uh, you know, fun class. And so I'm sitting next to this guy, and we get quite friendly, and eventually we start talking about what we're gonna do next year. So he's like, what are you gonna do? I was like, well, you know, I'm gonna work at this public interest uh, law firm in New York. And I said, you know, what are you gonna do? He's like, well, I'm either gonna do a philosophy PhD, or I'm gonna go teach law in India. And he's a white guy. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And he's like, oh, yeah, there's this new law school called uh, Jindal Global Law School. Have you heard of it? Like, nope. Um, and it was Jonathan Gingerich, who had, I think, interned with Raj the year before. And I just feel it, it's just an incredible coincidence that I happened to take this course with this guy, sat next to him, and asked him this question, <laughs> because I literally would not be here if it wasn't for that. Um, and then he put me in touch with Jonathan McLeod, and then everything happened. Okay. Um, so I'm very grateful to Jonathan Gingrich, and I've told him that uh, on many occasions. Uh, I have three quick recollections of when I first got here. So the first is, you know, when you first arrive, you come with all your stuff, and they send a driver. And so you get into this random car, and you're kind of going. And then after an hour, I'm like, oh, shit, I'm still in this car. <laughs> uh, and, like, it seems like we're getting further and further from civilization. <laughs> Then he turns into Bisumil. I'm like, okay, now he's definitely going to kill me. Then I was like, no lights anywhere. It was like pitch black, middle of the night. You know how flights land in Delhi, 10, 11 p.m. And then suddenly, there's this like beacon of light, Jindal, like appears on the horizon. No, it was really an amazing moment. Yeah, yeah. There's like literally nothing. This is not like now when you have all these shopping malls on the highway. There was nothing there. Uh, so I remember that very distinctly. Um, a second memory I have was, I think, on my very first day of teaching, I came to the classroom, and this is a bit like, I think, um, what Amanji was saying earlier. There were these two life-size um, cutouts of human bodies, one male and one female, with all the body parts written in, in great detail, including, like, you know, private parts. And I was like, Jesus Christ, where, where have I come? Like, what, what is this? Of course, it was Oishik sociology class that had just, just finished. <laughs> so that was interesting. Um, and then the third, my third initial recollection was that I had the good fortune of uh, having Shilpi as an office mate. So Shilpi and I were office mates, and she's the one who introduced me to all of these folks. Um, and my big memory from the first year was that Shilpi was very up, up to date on the latest gossip, which she... Which she <laughs> which she called the goss. So, and not just like faculty gossip, but like which student was dating whom, whatever. <laughs> but the thing that I would do is that I would take Shilpi's information and pass it off as my own so I could be cool among the faculty. Um, but then Shilpi went to do her PhD and everyone was like, Sorry, Han, what's happening this week? <laughs> I don't know. So I lost some social cred after she left. Okay. Uh, jokes aside, I'd like to say a couple of quick things about teaching, research, and friendship. I've taken 
made some notes here so I don't forget. So I think the main thing that Jindal taught me um, was how symbiotic research and teaching are. I always thought that research was something you do on your own and then teaching is just the kind of, you know, speaking to a classroom. Um, and so a couple of things I'd like to highlight. So one of my main research areas was economic and social rights, uh, which is an interest I had before I got here, but I obviously really developed here. Um, and it, it occurred to me at some point that I was writing about this very theoretically, and I'd like to know a little bit more about how these kinds of laws, you know, the right to food, the right to education, actually apply um, to real life. And so Divika and I had a chat, and we're like, you know, what's, what's really missing a jindal is a kind of clinic where you can go out and do this. Not with due respect to Ajay Pandey, his clinic was a little different. Um, and this is the beauty of Jindal. We went to Raj and we're like, you know, we think we should have these clinics. And he's like, yeah, done. And a week later, we had a clinic, which was really, really incredible. Um, and that's my fondest memory of Jindal. We had so many good field trips with those students. We got to know them really well. Uh, my wife came here and taught for two years in the clinic, and she remembers it very fondly. Um, and then that informed my subsequent research on socioeconomic rights, which was much better for having that kind of real life experience and going to all the villages around here um, and in UP. So that was terrific. Um, the other thing I'd say about teaching, and you, you sort of touched on this, for those of us who didn't have an Indian law background, we were basically unqualified to teach anything, right? Especially me, because I didn't even have any work experience. So you have to teach English, right? Legal writing and torts. These are the three things that you teach. Um, and I must say, I was not looking forward to any of them. Um, I was like, okay, I guess I'll have to do it, and then eventually I can teach something else. But it turns out that actually that was a blessing in disguise. So whenever I meet former students, I would say 90% of the time, they will say, I really loved your legal writing class, which is an amazing thing to say. Like, I would never have thought that that would make an impression on them, but it did. Um, and as for torts, um, that too has become an area of interest of mine, especially how tort law has been constitutionalized in South Asia. Um, and I really learned that from my students and from teaching. So I, as I said, I really think Jindal, um, because it's so good on both the research and teaching front, um, I think the two really talk to each other. And they certainly did in my case. Um, and then a final word about friendship. I think, sort of jokes aside about Sonipath, I think the fact that you're kind of out here on an island leads to a certain bonding and deepness of friendship, both with colleagues and with students. So just a, uh, just a quick example of this. Um, I was in New York a few weeks ago, and we were only there for two weeks. And you know, we have a small baby now, so limited social engagements. And my in-laws just couldn't believe how 60 to 70% of my social engagements were Jindal related. I had to go and get Ethiopian food with Prashant Iyengar, because I always get Ethiopian food with Prashant Iyengar. I had to get brunch with Anisa Rahim, because I always get brunch with Anisa Rahim. And then it turned out that four of my former students are all at Columbia doing their LLM. So of course I had to take them out to lunch, right? Um, and that was, that was literally three out of my five social engagements over two weeks. So I think the friendships are really deep and meaningful. Um, I think it's very, very difficult to recreate that anywhere else. Um, I really like my current institution, but what I miss is the kind of depth of friendship. I don't think you really get that in most places. Um, and I'm very grateful to you all for that. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rehan. It's an amazing um, uh, reflection. And I guess uh, you're right about the friendship part. Uh, wherever we travel, whichever part we travel, I guess we do carry uh, those friendships along, both our colleagues as well as students. Uh, Abhay? Thanks. It feels absolutely wonderful to be here and uh, meet so many uh, old friends and feel the old energy, which is now a new energy, uh, at this, I think, uh, very important place uh, uh, on the map. So. Uh, as I was thinking of what I might say uh, today, I was staying with a friend uh, in Delhi who's a partner at uh, the Indian law firm Amar Chand, and uh, uh, he told me that, he gave me a few ideas, he said, talk about how you were really terrified going into class for the full first year and you felt nauseous every morning, and I said, no, 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 and finally he said, hey, here's a little story that uh, uh, I think is uh, reflective of your experience, which is, one of our uh, students, Malika, is now working with Amar Chand, and she apparently told him that uh, uh, I taught her and her class uh, Indian civil procedure in and through uh, German theory relating to civil procedure. So when he told me that, my first question to him was, uh, 
did she say it in a nice way or <laughs> right? And and he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She she totally she totally liked you. And and uh, of course, my I was uh, temporarily safe. But that got me thinking about the kind of teacher I was in 2009. And I was just starting my teaching career then, uh, though I'd been an environmental activist for a few years. And I realized that it's been a, a crazy journey where uh, I no longer face uh, that uncertainty and terror of uh, impressing others uh, in what I do today. And, and for a good part of my Jindal experience, uh, seeking the esteem of others uh, was on uh, top of my mind. And I think it, it was something in the culture here uh, that allowed me to uh, overcome that insecurity of fear and uh, almost like Maslow, you know, try to uh, 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 sort of uh, attempt self-actualization, whatever that might be. So uh, I'd like to start my reflections today by, by talking uh, with uh, a bit of focus on the vanishing present and the future rather than heading straight to the past, right? And I think uh, where I am today on reflection uh, owes uh, tremendously to my three very fulfilling years at this university from 2009 to 2012. Firstly, I think uh, I'm someone who in my consulting practice today uh, makes this rather bold claim that I can help you transform the world with urgency and precision. And uh, if you think you have an impossible challenge, uh, you found the consultant you're looking for, I can make that happen, right? And uh, in a sense, I think uh, the gentleman at the head of the table, along with everyone else uh, who was around at the university in 2009, mm, were the fountainhead for that confidence and uh, that level of uh, calm aspiration towards uh, something that has not been attempted before. Second, I have uh, uh, sort of being someone who loves a whole bunch of things, I've, I've now become clear that I want to dedicate my professional life to almost in the way of the bodhisattva, alleviating the suffering of others, right? And uh, uh, for me, uh, interactions with uh, students and interactions with uh, scholars and researchers, most notably Professor Bakshi, who played an important role at a faculty development seminar, I think it was 2010 or 2011, sort of cemented that as a, a worthy life goal, right? That is, uh, what are you really doing to, to make life better for others? And I think the, the mission of this university as well, establishing itself in Sonipat, uh, many people uh, sort of choosing this option over far more remunerative other uh, opportunities, uh, uh, sort of gave me the confidence to, to sort of embrace that as a life goal. Uh, third, today my activism, my research, my teaching is all about environmental consciousness uh, uh, that, that draws from an Indian sensibility. And uh, I think for the first time while I was at uh, Sonipat, uh, particularly taking late evening walks in the rather deserted and scary uh, uh, terrain where the Mahabharata supposedly occurred with big, strong, scary men with guns, etc. Uh, that, that was an entry into uh, a, an idiom, grammar, and uh, a language that as an English-speaking cosmopolitan Indian had never been exposed to. And I think uh, taking my students to uh, uh, the Sonipat police station, walking around Sonipat town, etc., etc., in, in a sense, uh, opened my eyes to the richness that's present in this country. And I'm uh, delighted to see that we have glass bottles now from the plastic bottles that were there in 2009. And uh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, eco-consciousness on campus, which I'm truly appreciative of. Finally, I think uh, one of my jobs as a member of a collaborative team is uh, the very difficult job of being the keeper of standards, which makes me an unpleasant person who's always pointing out that that's not good enough, that's not good enough, that's not good enough. And, and reflecting, and, and it's a very valued uh, mm, uh, contribution I bring. People want me for that in my professional work today, either designing courses or consulting on projects. And I realized that uh, that was a skill and an ability that uh, uh, I, I sort of got my initial training with in this room, right? And 
uh, I think it is the uh, fantastic humanism of people such as Raj and DK and Aman that are scholars uh, uh, and uh, administrators with decades of experience who every time there was this young arrogant person in the room saying that's not cool enough, we have to do it better, oh but at Yale they do it this way, uh, sort of uh, generously accepted the responsibility for these misgivings as their responsibility. Right? While the fact of the matter is uh, all of us were implicated in the same project. So, so that is something that I'm truly, truly grateful for. Now, I think uh, turning back to the past, I can just uh, almost in stream of consciousness telegraphically make a few impressions that have really, really stayed with me after 10 years. The first was uh, Peter and Marcy sort of looking at me, trying to be impressive as a young assistant professor at Yale. And after a, a short speech about my research and scholarship, Peter with nothing but kindness in his voice saying, you're just a really young pip, aren't you? And, and uh, <laughs> he sort of committed to, to mentoring me in the days ahead, and, and that has stayed in my mind. Second is uh, Jane Shikorsky. I, I, I have just uh, uh, been bowled over by her amazing, amazing kindness, her professionalism, uh, her unflagging dedication to promoting transformative education in India, which is something that uh, I have uh, committed my own energies to. Third, I think Priya mentioned this point, uh, 10 courses in three years uh, have been uh, an absolutely wonderful addition to uh, my resume and have made up for all of the failings of my own law school education. Uh, fourth, being a program coordinator for the BALB program and uh, uh, sort of uh, coming after Paddy and, uh, and seeing what happens when a program coordinator doesn't do much and allows, uh, uh, allows things to organically happen. That, that was a good learning experience. Tihar Jail and Sonipat Police Station I've mentioned. Uh, the protest workshop. I, I remember only Oishik, but I, I think Deepika, you were involved as well and there were others. I think uh, for me that was a seminal movement, uh, sort of moment in terms of what is possible with interdisciplinary education in a law school in India. Uh, I, I still, 10 years later, have not seen uh, events of that caliber being pulled off with uh, that poise and confidence. So it constantly inspires me to do better when I'm in my organizational mode. Uh, a philosophy reading group that uh, uh, I had the chance to host in my home, uh, with Peter Shaji and others wondering whether they could smoke cigarettes and have drinks given that they were in a safe space of a faculty residence and we were after all talking philosophy. Uh, just for the record, uh, they were not permitted to do any of, <laughs> any of that. Uh, uh, helping start uh, a debating movement uh, on campus that was uh, very valuable for me. Uh, the biggest, I think, uh, memory, and, and it, it continues, is learning so much from uh, for my colleagues, and Priya mentioned this point as well. I think I had fabulous teachers in, in my colleagues here, and uh, some of that uh, has really become a part of my own uh, research method. Mm, Ajay Pandey taking me to the first two villages that uh, Jindal University was interacting with uh, in 2009, which now I understand. I mean, Jindal is, has transformed this geography as well, so that's, that's a clear sign of, of the progress made. So as I end, I think uh, I, uh, I want to just uh, uh, echo uh, Sri Ram's point of, uh, of the importance of uh, maintaining and, and continuing to forge ahead. And I think the three uh, sort of elements in, in that originary culture that were key to the extraordinary success of Jindal, firstly was this belief in doing the impossible and uh, a sort of uh, almost a chaotic uh, confidence that an excellence that had not been seen before could be achieved. And I think that was very important in motivating everyone else. Uh, second, I think, uh, and I don't know if this has changed with 450-odd faculty, uh, in those original days, I think all faculty felt that they owned the place. And that gave me confidence to sometimes uh, sort of say no to Raj sort of very, very casually. No, Raj, I don't agree with you at all. And uh, that allowed me to give the best that I had to give to the place in those three years. So I think that idea of ownership and autonomy, if it can be somewhere, in some way preserved 
even as scaling up occurs, that would be great. Thirdly, I think the point I alluded to earlier, which now uh, as a mature, uh, a somewhat more mature academic uh, I'm trying to embrace is uh, uh, taking responsibility for what's wrong rather than stopping at pointing out what's wrong. It's very easy uh, in universities in India to start uh, uh, bitching everyone from the chancellor downwards, uh, including a colleague who you think is doing less than you or is slacking off, but what can you do to uh, contribute to the learning experience of uh, either the chancellor or your, or your colleague as well. I think that becomes an important ethical question to grapple with. So thank you once again for having me here. Yeah, lovely, Abharaj. I think it was very interesting to, uh, to listen to Priya, Rehan, and Abhay. You had interesting times here, and after moving out of uh, Jindal also, the kind of things you're doing, and uh, your association continues. I think that's very, very heartening. And I think credit also goes to Raj that I think this is very unique. I've, and I could say this because of the fact that I've served in almost eight institutions. It is very unique to Raj as well as to Jindal that, as Gulzar says, haath chute to rishte nahi chhoda karte. So you've always kept that, and then that's the reason that, for example, Shilpi is back here, Oishik is back here after their uh, academic journeys, Yugank is back here. Uh, that you've always wanted to bring people back because you've realized that they've, when they were here, they had great, they've, they've, the contribution was very, very immense. And, and that's unique because that's not as very true to many other institutions. They don't treat people who leave very kindly. You've not only treated people kindly, but you've also treated people a lot more with respect with their professional work they've been doing. They might not be working with you, but that doesn't change the relationship or the work we had done earlier together, and that's true between you and I as well. So now Deepika and Oshik, because they've been here as pillars of this place, Deepika particularly has been, uh, from the day one, I know Deepika was the assistant dean for law school. I was the assistant for the business school. So for anything which we had to do with DK and Aman, I think four or five of us used to be uh, there uh, running around for, for doing those things. And you've taken a lot of uh, hard work, especially uh, the moot. At least I, I remember uh, your focus. And then that paid well because for the first time when Jindal Law School started defeating the national law school, and, and Sriram had talked about bringing credibility and validation. I guess people came in because of what we were doing, but the validation of an external world when a Jindal Law School team beating the national law schools in Alsars and others has brought in a lot more. So the focus, I remember Deepika, it's your turn. So all yours, please. Thank you, Dwari. Um, I'm just very emotional, and this is so nice. So, and I'm one of those uninterrupted tenure people, very few people who've been here for 10 years. Uh, and a lot of people ask me, why Jindal? What makes you stick to Jindal? And why don't you have an expiry date? Which is like a really strange question. <laughs> and um, I just tell them that uh, possibility is only a dream away. And that's how my 10 years have been in Jindal. And that's what makes me really happy here. And it's not like I wasn't happy in my previous job. I loved litigation. But somewhere the possibilities were not a dream away. And I think that's what makes this place special. So I'm going to reflect on... Um, friendship, because um, for me, teaching and research has been a very exciting adventure with very close friends. And I have been accused by my colleagues uh, when I took up the academic dean's um, uh, position, you know, and I was heading the academic, uh, academic dean's office. I was supposed to set up the board of studies, which we didn't have earlier. And one of my colleagues said, you only have your friends in that board. And I said, yes. And I look around, and I'm like, you're right. But uh, that was a question in 2014, and that would not have been a question two years back because everyone here was a friend. So while, uh, well, like right from Raj to end of the table, I have had a professional relationship with each one of them and very deep friendships, and I value that the most. And um, so I just want to reflect on some of those things. So um, Aristotle, for example, has written on many things. He also writes on friendships. And he says that there are two characteristics which make friendship very special. The first one is that you have to lo love each other for your own sake and not for the sake of the other. But the most important is that 
uh, you have to wish good things for each other. And that's the second characteristic is what I found very heartwarming in Jindal, where you've never been in competition. And academia, as I hear from others, can be very toxic and competitive, but that's not how it's been. In fact, it's only been collaborative, supportive, and inspiring. So I just, I'm also very grateful that I've had that sort of uh, friendships from day one, but also how that led to many things in Jindal, including the administrative thing. So uh, I've, I've um, uh, worked with Oishik, for example, a lot. So sometimes I say Oishik is my intellectual soul because we've worked so much together that sometimes he, we are thinking the same things and as he says it, I complete it. And I find that very inspiring. So when I came to Jindal, I was doing health law and patents, but I get very bored very easily. So if you look at my CV, I've worked from refugee law to many things and, I, and it just, I'm constantly looking for a change. And Oishik at that point was working on queer politics. And I love that. And when I started talking to him, he said, let's do something exciting. And Priya said, I want to do something exciting too. She was from law firm. You know, this typical sort of labeling that was going on. Like you're a human rights litigator, mainstream human rights litigator, I was called at that point. Uh, and she did a course on revenge. And I did a course on law, sexuality, and films. And I remember I set up that syllabus with Oishik. And, and that was the most exciting thing I did in my entire career here. Uh, because I've never actually formally taken a course on sexuality or gender. Actually, I went to a, a women's college, which is one of the best in Asia, and I never took a course on feminism. And now it's like a full circle, because that's what I'm doing now. And, um, and then we started working a lot on many things. So we thought of uh, conceptualizing something radical, and we thought, let's do a, a journal with all the people who do critical legal theory write for us. And we said, how do we pitch this to Raj? And I was like, we pitch it as it is. And when we went to Raj, he said, absolutely. And that's the possibility, right? You dream of something and you have that. And we did this journal together, which is one of the most exciting things, followed by the Left in the Dark conference. And all of that has really added to my intellectual journey, like from being a mainstream, breathless human rights lawyer, I learned to breathe in different ways. And that has been really um, empowering. But also, um, I wrote an article with uh, Rehan, which was the, one of our most cited articles on domestic violence. And um, Rehan, uh, after one year, calls me and says, I just read your introduction. And you're a post-colonial scholar? You didn't tell me that when we were writing together. <laughs> I am never going to write with you. <laughs> he made that call. And, um, and with Priya, we just thought, let's do something exciting. And then we wrote an article when we were on, a, she was flying somewhere else and I was flying somewhere else and we wrote it on the plane together in two days. And so that's the kind of uh, friendships we've had and it's been 10 years and we're always meeting, find reasons to meet in different places. Uh, I recently did a pedagogy workshop, which is one of my main interests, to look at pedagogy in classroom, the ethics of care in classroom, which goes beyond the subject but also the pedagogy of how do you care for students. And I did a pedagogy workshop with Shilpi and it was such a humbling experience to work with somebody like Shilpi. So I'm constantly inspired. But I also want to say in the administration can be very difficult and very taxing and also very, because it's a very ungrateful job, you're constantly being accused of not doing enough and not being fair. But having worked with Raj, I feel like, so there's this friendship there with Raj as well where you can disagree and it can be gentle or not, but you reach a consensus, and it's always been great. But one of my memories of Raj is, which I really respect, and it's also inspiring for me to be an administrator. He never, he lets things go, and he doesn't hold on to grudges. He doesn't say that, okay, this guy was disagreeing for no reason. So one of the memories is that one of our colleagues was not having a good time, and you know there were a lot of problems, and I said, Raj, what, what should we do? And, and surprisingly, a lot of our faculty members, who are otherwise liberal, were actually not very nice in that situation. And he said, no, we must support this colleague. We must do something which makes this, the workplace not hostile. And we actually did, uh, reduced the teaching load, and we made sure we had enough sort of framework for him to work on. And he did actually manage really well after three years. And I thought, this is a place that allows for dreams, but also allows for dreams with sensitivity. And I have always felt really amazed, amazing about, I'm, I've always been amazed about these things, but also I've learned so much. Just, you're not born an administrator and you don't have a degree in MBA, 
but how do you do this? How do you work with people and make people sort of come, you know, recruit people in your dream? And I think I learned that from Raj. Like you recruit people and say that let's do this together. And that's how my journey's been. Or the clinical course that I did with um, uh, Rehan. But I want to end, uh, end by saying that I'm, I taught, my first course was legal methods and I had a huge fight with Paddy saying that I don't want to teach legal methods because I did three year law and this is five year law school and I've never studied legal methods. And he said, no, 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 you just have to do it. I said, fine. And then we, Abhay, me and James, we sat in a hotel room and drafted the course manual. And while we were doing that, I just eased into the course because I had these amazing colleagues and we had, Abhay and me sometimes had very gentle disagreements about which case should we teach for judicial activism, Vishaka or judges appointment. And now I'm teaching that course after 10 years again with my uh, former student Ajitta as a co-instructor and it's just been amazing. And while everything else is in the past, the friendships is in the continuum. So I'm constantly having conversations with Abhay and saying that this French course, what do you think? Or, or how do I teach logic? Let me ask James in my mind. And, and it's just been amazing to have Ajita in the classroom and have these students. And I'm constantly telling students, in 2009, that student answered that question in this way. And Ajita is like, <laughs> why do you keep going back to 2009? But I'm like, that's the only memory I have. So, it's, so, so I'll just end here and say that my journey has been full of, it's very heartwarming and inspiring and full of gratitude. Thank you, Deepika. <laughs> I guess uh, the law school uh, owes a lot to Deepika's initial years of work as, as assistant dean and of course Paddy in absentia has done phenomenal work to set up the administrative <coughs> part of it and that's rightly said, I've been an administrator for almost 20 years, I know it's a thankless job, but uh, you're right about it, yeah. Talking about administration, I remember Deepika as an assistant dean academic affairs, one night around 8 p.m., 100 students were outside your room, <laughs> Because you have definitely defaults of the night examination. Oh, I remember the way you handled them and you know, you are quite... Deepika became the new party. Hopefully not. But she's been pretty tough since day one, I know. She's been pretty... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she became the new party. Right. Okay, Oishik. Yes. Sorry, sorry, Steve. say something, having heard that, it was deeply moving for me, but there is one thing that I think is symbolic of one of the reasons why I'm so attached to this institution is that one of the works that you wrote and one of the researches that you did locally yeah. led to some that you published with the Center for Reproductive Rights, um, led to some concerns of yeah. local authorities. Yeah. And I have to give credit to Raj. I've told this story, uh, of course, not revealing the details, uh, this is one of the signs of what academic freedom really means. Yeah. There was not a problem of what you were doing. He could have been profoundly in disagreement. It doesn't matter at all. Saying, oh, one of my jobs is vice chancellor. I have to deal with these fellows who come in and explain to me. I have to, you know, quiet them down and so on. But the, there was never for one I, instant anything of saying, oh, we have to, you know, kind of calm her down and not get her to write things that are so controversial that challenge some of the local authorities and so on. It was just not, not even in his mind. And I think that is one of the yeah. things that has really, really Absolutely. led me to admire your work and, of course, admire the leadership from Raj. Thanks. OK, so I'm going to follow Raj's brief and not talk about him. So what I'm going to share uh, are not thoughts that I can actually call my own entirely. I think these are thoughts that, uh, in a certain way, are, are collaboratively authored. It will resonate with a lot of ideas and uh, reflections that have already gone around this room. Um, um, so some of it might sound repetitive, but for good reason. I'm thinking of repetition as uh, uh, a necessary recognition of uh, the resilience of, of a certain set of ideas. Um, I kept thinking, what might I call uh, these, these brief reflections? And I, and I thought I should call them against nostalgia or against romanticizing you know, the, the 10 years or, or against memorializing them. But this is a, this is a, this is a moment where uh, 
uh, which, which presents nostalgia, uh, uh, a romance about, about this space and memorializing it as a strange kind of seduction and I will partly succumb to it. Um, so these are tempered thoughts uh, in that sense. Uh, and this, this particular room, and Priya was mentioning it, just the material presence of us being here. Uh, I, in fact, have an oral memory of this space. Uh, it's, it's a memory that, uh, that works through the register of sound, uh, uh, which was uh, of faculty, uh, repeated faculty board meetings uh, as a deeply contrarian space animated through the sound of disagreements. Um, and that's an abiding memory. And uh, of course, today's uh, the, 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 the more uh, um, prevalent sound today has been laughter. And that's an interesting contrast uh, for me, uh, and a happy contrast. Um, um, and it's, it's this sound of laughter which, was, which is deeply effective, uh, an effective intensity now in comparison to the sounds of disagreement uh, 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 contrarian disagreement is what I think is, in a way, for me, the spirit of, of JGU, and, and, I, and I hope it's for, for many others. Um, uh, and it's this nature of, of, of contradictions that, uh, uh, that we've lived with over the last 10 years and continue to is uh, what makes, had made my time earlier here very exciting and continues to be so even now. Um, the, the sense of, uh, of contradiction was particularly pronounced uh, given the kind of set of shared vulnerabilities that all of us kind of carried with us when we moved here in 2009. And what was a really important question then and, and, and so it remains for me now is what does it mean to be connected through doubt under an overarching umbrella of ambition and hope? Um, and to be able to keep alive that doubt and skepticism even as you are working within a certain kind of larger committed goal of, uh, of, of, of idealism is a, a profoundly troubling paradox. And I want that paradox to be alive uh, in, in the kind of work that I do. Uh, that phrase, profoundly troubling paradox, is of course not mine. Uh, it's a phrase that was very evocatively used by Patricia Williams in her fantastic piece on being the object of property, which is a piece that I teach in my jurisprudence class. Um, and um, allow me to briefly digress to tell you why she uses that expression. It's an important expression, an expression that has some bearing on, on, on this moment. Um, she talks about, she opens the piece by talking about uh, uh, having uh, got through uh, uh, Harvard Law School and she should now go there as a, as a, uh, as a colored uh, woman student and she's petrified of the idea, what would it mean to inhabit that extremely white space? Uh, and her mother comes to give her some kind of solace. She says, don't worry, you have uh, the blood of lawyers in you. And she wonders, who is this lawyer in, in, you know, in, in my life? And her mother tells her that uh, your great, great, great grandmother uh, was in fact uh, uh, sold as a slave to a white slave owner. Uh, he forcibly impregnated her. And that's the kind of line that our families followed. And she kept wondering, what kind of a strange moment is this? Um, the very thing that I'm being asked to draw confidence from has in fact been the cause of my people's disinheritance. How do I inhabit this moment of what she calls uh, a profoundly troubling paradox? Um, and I think uh, her work uh, 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 has in fact been a testimony to, to how does one live a life of profoundly troubling paradoxes uh, through a commitment to um, critical legal scholarship. Um, and so this paradox is alive for me in, in the time that I uh, 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 spend as an academic at Jindal, I've spent here uh, in, in its initial founding years and when I returned in 2006, uh, it's a paradox that's animated through the dissonances between what I teach in the classroom and what kind of lives my students go on to live. Uh, it's a paradox that's alive in my political commitments, uh, my political co commitments that I 
publicly espouse and the kind of uh, academic or uh, private life that I live. It's animated uh, uh, through the dissonance between the headiness of uh, a metrics-driven uh, register of success, which is the case in most universities in the world, and my own kind of uh, difficult attempts at trying to live uh, what might be called a life that's marked by a philosophy of slowness, to slow things down, to take things at, at a time. Um, and, and, and finally, uh, the kind of dissonance that, for example, exists between the ex institutional experience that we have as, as both founding faculty and faculty otherwise, uh, uh, in comparison to, for example, uh, the, the lives of the material institution builders in, in, in this university space. Um, and it's also a certain kind of paradox that uh, that's that's uh, reflected in how uh, former detractors of this university have now kind of become part of it. So uh, it's 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 the university is in in that sense has been um, a, a remarkably hospitable hospitable space for paradoxes. And to be hospitable to paradoxes is, I think, uh, one of the greatest learnings for me. Uh, in, 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 in JGU. So if I can sum it up there, um, my biggest learning, uh, a life lesson from my time here, from what I've learned from my colleagues, uh, uh, who I would actually rather call friends than colleagues, uh, uh, is never to neutralize paradoxes. Uh, never attempt to try and overcome them, but to be able to account for them in my work. Uh, uh, to be able to um, treat failure not as a path to success, uh, as kind of new age speak goes, or, or as a form of complacency, uh, but to think of failure as, as Deepika was, was pointing out earlier, as an ethic of, of responsibility uh, that only adds to the, the, the foundations of uh, my scholarly work. Um, and I think one of the things that all of us have done very different ways, possibly not using the kind of language that I'm using, is to, is to account honestly for the paradoxes that we've brought to our lives uh, in, in, in this space called, uh, called JGU. Um, I'll end, and uh, you know, when when I was at the kind of closing end of my first tenure here, um, and, and, I, and I, so I reached a certain moment of wanting to publicly talk about this this life of paradoxes, and I wrote a piece um, in on the blog um, called Kafila, uh, called uh, "Complicity and Contamination in the Neoliberal Academy." And uh, I'm just going to read out the last paragraph. I hadn't read it since the time I wrote it, but it seem, seems quite prescient uh, for this moment as well. And I think those of us in this room uh, bear a commitment to, um, uh, to this kind of closing paragraph. Uh, we might do better to strengthen our belief that teaching does have a radical transformative potential. And that's only something that I've learned from my time here. A reason because of which many of us are academics. If we take ourselves a little less seriously um, and infuse indeterminacy in our ideas, that's possibly my kind of uh, uh, realist inflection. Um, an indeterminacy that does not lead to vagueness but one that propels more exciting political possibilities. And I think the protest workshop, in a sense, was also a testimony to that paradox of uh, political possibilities in a space that others would write off as a space that could ever be hospitable to uh, a conference on protest. Um, and as a young academic with a declared left political ideology, I'd expect some indeterminacy from those I look up to. And I was actually speaking to Arundhati Roy in this response uh, for the kind of writing of that she did uh, in, in, in the wake of the, of, the, of the workshop being held here. 
I'd expect some indeterminacy from those I look up to, the ones who I draw inspiration from, to take the politics of indeterminacy more seriously than they have so far. I'm aware of their courageous works and sometimes acts of contamination, but to foreground their complicities will make them more human, fallible, and accessible to me, and I am sure to many others like me who are torn between the complicity and contamination of our initial days in the neoliberal academy that increasingly treats the leftist scholar doing humanities who resists turning their students into technocrats as an outcast. It will be an act of generosity if you sing to us the Gil Scott Heron song to dispel the myths of infallibility that surround you. Yes, so tell me, why can't you understand that there ain't no such thing as a superman? There ain't no such thing as a superman. I don't know if this will do anything to our vision of achieving a just world, but it will most certainly make us be truthful to the work that we do and have the strength to counter our complicities with stronger strategies of contamination. And I think the 10 years at JGU really kind of bear out a commitment to that struggle. And I'm glad that that struggle, even if not uh, uh, visible to us in the way the university appears to, to, to the public, is alive and kicking in each one of us who inhabit this space. So um, thank you for being hospitable. Um. In fact, two messages uh, from Jonathan and Ashwini um, that, that I'd like to share. Uh, it's addressed to all of us. Um, and Jonathan writes, uh, we wish we could be with you. I would want to see how tall the trees are now on campus, whether Sodexo made it through 10 years as the preferred <laughs> on-campus food provider, but mostly and quite aside from the wonder and the ongoing accomplishments of the thousands of students, hundreds of faculty, and the recent addition of star faculty, we would want to be amongst a collection of people that we hold dear. Ashley was the one who seriously considered the India trip, but we simply couldn't pull it off in the end. As for me, I still hear from students, I probably write half a dozen letters of recommendation per year. It's a wonderful experience because it lets me know that JGLS students and graduates are dreaming big. Congratulations, Raj, for your vision and commitment. Surely JGU as it exists today exceeds even your own hopes. Congratulations, those of you who were there at the beginning and remain, as well as to those who have returned after academic adventures. Much love from Florida. May our paths cross soon. And now from Ashwini. Yeah, this is, uh, it was, the, what I read out was by Jonathan, and this is from Ashwini. Um, I arrived at JGU in 2012 on what was meant to be a one-year fellowship, and then on to a career in corporate law in London. But when the time came to leave, I couldn't. I was learning too much at this dynamic institution, enjoyed the intellectual and social community amongst the faculty, and felt like I was a part, even if only a very small part, of something that was exciting and new and urgently needed. My time at JGU set me on a career in academia and gave me a global perspective on law and legal education. In the last six years, JGU has only grown in strength and reputation, providing what, has been, uh, what can be done with a lot of vision, the right leadership, and inspiring people. In the years since I left, the importance of academic freedom and the university as a site of dissent and justice has become more evident across the world. I'm very grateful for all the lessons I learned from friends amongst the faculty on intellectual inquiry and the importance of being a citizen scholar. As an aspiring scholar, I couldn't ask for better role models. 